starts right now. It is second only to Hurricane Harvey. That's how a Harris County Sheriff's deputy is describing the situation as thousands in East Texas are now recovering from a weekend filled with flooding. Everything we know about the damage coming up. And new leadership has been elected for Uvalde CISD. It's the first school board election since the tragedy at Robb Elementary. One new member has a close connection to the tragedy, and he tells us what he wants to get done. But first. More than one third of all DACA recipients are uninsured. Under the DACA program, people whose parents brought them into the U.S. as children are protected from deportation. But that didn't come with medical coverage. Well, the Biden administration just announced a plan that would make them eligible to sign up for the Affordable Care Act health insurance. A San Antonio Dreamer tells our Daniela Ibarra the decision gives her and others freedom. In 10 days, Andrea Rathbone Ramos will head to Yankee Stadium to celebrate earning her master's degree from NYU. I feel like every day it's a blessing. It's a blessing, she says, was given to her by DACA, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. Right now, she and others who were brought to the U.S. as kids are shielded from deportation and authorized to work and learn in the U.S. Andrea isn't sure how long she'll have that protection. It's almost like that prickly feeling when you're watching that horror movie of you don't know when it the big jump scare is going to happen. Um, it's kind of like that. Another thing that has scared some dreamers is the need for health insurance. Andrea says she's insured through school and her job. Several years ago, she wasn't. It's why she says she let a broken bone go untreated for months. I knew that it was either going to ruin Christmas for my family and I, or I was going to basically uh, have to figure out a way to pay for that health care. It, it, it like basically either Christmas or health care. And now the Biden administration is creating a new rule to help dreamers avoid making that choice. It's expanding federal health care for dreamers. The feds expect 100,000 people to sign up. So it really is a huge it, it's a huge thing that this is finally available for us. She says now other working dreamers will be able to reap the benefits they've been paying for. I've seen Medicare, Medicaid. Uh, Social Security, all of these things are taken out of my paycheck, but I don't have access to them. Finally, now I have access to the Affordable Care Act. Andrea says it gives DACA recipients more freedom. You may choose to leave a job that you might have not liked, or uh, maybe you want to become a stay-at-home parent. Um, maybe you want to continue going to school, and maybe you couldn't do that because of those health care needs. Daniela Ibarra, KSAT 12 News. We want to mention a spokeswoman for the Trump campaign sent out a statement criticizing this decision. She says the former president wants to focus on sealing the border and stopping what he calls an invasion of immigrants. Well, millions of Texas from Fort Worth down to Houston were under flood alerts today again. 224 people have had to be rescued from flooding in Texas. One five-year-old boy even died after being swept away in floodwaters in Fort Worth earlier today. And ABC News reports that the stretch of Texas between Beaumont and College Station has had 800 percent of its normal rainfall in just the last week. Flooding isn't anything new to East Texas, and it has reminded many first responders of the damage that came with Hurricane Harvey back in 2017. These people live down here. They've been through this before. They experienced Hurricane Harvey. And the way this is, it's not region-wide like Hurricane Harvey was, but in this area, it's second only to Hurricane Harvey. Flooding in the Trinity River near Houston is expected to be in a major flood stage for at least the next seven days. It is so difficult to see these images. They talk about Hurricane Harvey, yeah. Mia, and you know, we all, we were, we were there for a lot of that, and these images are difficult to even imagine. Yeah, the video that's been coming out of East yeah. Texas, Southeast Texas, has just been crazy to see over the past several days. While we do wish that we could have found even more rain here in South Central Texas, we don't like to see images like that and major flooding issues. Take a look at some of the rainfall reports over the past seven days, not just here in San Antonio, but across those areas. Here in town, just under an inch and a half since last Sunday. You take a look up to the north, Waco, Mejia, almost 10 inches. How about Huntsville over there in Walker County? 18 and a half inches of rain have fallen since last Sunday, almost 13 inches even farther off to the east in Woodville. So yes, you can imagine with totals like that, 
that's when we start to see images like what we just looked at. Now the good news is those areas will see a little bit of a break in the days ahead. For us, weather headlines into the upcoming week. Mornings will still be damp, patchy fog, drizzle and mist with the humidity. Afternoons though, trending hot and humid. 90s in the forecast by Tuesday. Later on this week, it's possible we see a cool front move in ahead of next weekend that could bring us a small break in the humidity and temperatures. We're going to time it all out. Get you those details coming up in just a few, Courtney. Thank you, Mia. Well, the uncle of a Robb Elementary School victim will now serve on the Uvalde CISD School Board. Last night, voters elected Jesse Rizzo to serve as a trustee. Rizzo is the uncle of Jackie Casares. He's been critical of the school board's lack of transparency and accountability since May 24th. He says he hopes to bring compassion and communication to the board. Rizzo calls the moments after his victory bittersweet. You know, just you remember that day, you know, but I think that the families and the community seeing an uncle sit up on the board, I think that that gives them hope. It begins a healing process. It begins that finally something takes place. Rizzo says the vote will be certified during the school board meeting next week. And this month, believe it or not, marks two years since the tragedy at Robb Elementary. To politics now, the May elections are over, meaning all attention now shifts to November's election, which is exactly six months away. A new ABC News Ipsos poll shows a tight race between President Joe Biden and former President Donald Trump as both men face high unfavorability ratings. ABC's Allison Kosick takes a look closer look at those numbers. Former President Trump hosting a multi-day retreat at his Mar-a-Lago resort in Palm Beach this weekend. In an audio recording from the event obtained by the Washington Post, Trump can allegedly be heard attacking and mocking state and federal prosecutors. The former president allegedly heard using expletives, berating special counsel Jack Smith, who's prosecuting him for his handling of classified documents and his role in the January 6th attack on the Capitol, in which he has denied any wrongdoing. Doing. Trump also allegedly compared himself to Al Capone and the Democrats to the Nazi secret police, major donors and top Republicans in attendance at the retreat, as well as several vice presidential hopefuls, including Senator Tim Scott, who told NBC. We had no conversations about the VP pick, but we had a lot of conversations about the failures of Joe Biden. Sources say the former president isn't very far along in the VP selection process. What Donald Trump is focused on is winning this election. What I'm focused on is helping him win and making sure Republicans win the Congress. A new ABC News Ipsos poll shows Biden and Trump leading a tight race as two unpopular candidates. Both candidates polled as more unfavorable than favorable among likely voters. Meanwhile, last week, President Biden made his third visit to North Carolina so far this year as he looks to win over voters in the traditionally red state. Biden touting his infrastructure law, which is funding lead pipe removal in North Carolina. Our landmark bipartisan infrastructure law is allowing states across the nation to do more by investing in record of record $15 billion so far nationwide. On Monday, Donald Trump will be back in a New York courtroom as testimony resumes in his hush money trial. He has denied any wrongdoing and has said the case is politically motivated. Allison Kosick, ABC News, New York. Well, the dust is starting to settle after that whirlwind election day. Municipal and education positions have been decided, as well as some props in certain areas. For that complete list of election results, we've got you covered. Scan the QR code on your screen right now for a complete view of every election near you. The U.S. Department of Agriculture now warning about some possibly contaminated chorizo that was sold at HEB. The affected product, the APCO All Natural Premium Chorizo, had a best buy date of May 12th. The warning was issued after some people found hard pieces of plastic and metal in the meat. If you bought this product, either throw it out or return it to where you bought it. The, pa the parent company of APCO, the San Antonio Packing Company, released a statement today acknowledging that a piece of plastic with metal was found in one of its products recently. They went on to say, quote, this is the only incident that has been reported. We have also made procedural and organizational changes to our product process specifically for this product to ensure that this does not occur again in the future, end quote. Early Monday morning, I... Um 
basically started going into like shock. This is one of two life altering experiences you will hear about claims of medical malpractice at the hands of military doctors. It's what two veterans went through. Our Lee Waldman and her final story for KSAT investigates takes us into the fight for the right to sue the federal government for military medical malpractice. That is at 1030. What is usually a calm and quiet weekend for many colleges has turned into quite the opposite. Commencements were interrupted by pro-Palestinian protesters on campuses all over America. The developments from a few of the schools impacted next on the Night Beast. You might have seen this headline lately. So what is Next Gen TV? Well, it's a new kind of signal for KSAT viewers who use an antenna to watch us. It gives them the perks of streaming without having to download an app. There's a KSAT Explains that talks about all the perks of Next Gen, including content customization, a restart feature, and more. Don't worry, KSAT is not going away. If you use an antenna, you just need to rescan your TV Monday after 2 p.m. And if you have questions, call our hotline to get some answers. College graduations interrupted this weekend by protests that have been playing out on college campuses across the nation. Many of the protesters are calling on universities to divest from companies that do business with Israel. These protests happening amid the war in Gaza, which is now a major campaign issue. ABC's Zareen Shaw is following all of the developments from Los Angeles. The LAPD on campus at USC early Sunday morning. The school's Department of Public Safety says officers were called in to provide security as the university worked to peacefully remove an illegal encampment. It seemed like um, the people in the encampment followed LAPD's orders. No arrests have been reported. Protesters gathering again at the University of Texas in Austin Sunday. We stand with Palestine. The Art Institute of Chicago Saturday, SWAT teams called in after pro-Palestinian protesters tried to set up an encampment, police facing off with them for hours. At least 68 people were arrested. <laughs> At the University of Virginia, police in riot gear moving in to clear an encampment. More than two dozen arrested. These protests, many of which have been going on for weeks, are now impacting graduation ceremonies. At the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, an encampment still on campus despite graduation events. This should have ended long ago, and the only way this will end is if our demands are met. Shut it down! Shut it down! The University of Michigan's graduation was briefly interrupted by pro-Palestinian protesters chanting and waving Palestinian flags. We shall not be in New York City, police moved in last week when protesters took over a building on Columbia University's campus. The police came in and in exactly two hours, everything was over. It was a beautiful thing to watch. These protests happening amid the war in Gaza are now a campaign issue. Breaking windows, shutting down campuses, forcing the cancellation of classes and graduations. None of this is a peaceful protest. New York City Mayor Eric Adams has said many of those arrested have been what he called outside agitators. When those protests reach the point of violence, as the president stated, uh, we have to ensure that we use a minimum amount of force uh, to terminate uh, what is perceived to be a threat. Zorin Shah, ABC News, Los Angeles. Many politicians are also acknowledging a huge rise in anti-Semitism at universities nationwide. After the UT Austin protests last week, Governor Greg Abbott tweeted this, anti-Semitism will not be tolerated in Texas, period. Students joining in hate-filled anti-Semitic protests at any public college or university in Texas should be expelled, end quote. These sentiments highlighted today, especially on Holocaust Remembrance Day. I'm very glad to be able to be here, that I'm still alive. One of the few that have, that have left out of the thousands of other veterans that didn't make it. Well spoken from World War II veteran Cruz Arizmendi. Well, the 100-year-old combat vet was at VFW Post 76 downtown today as the guest of honor to help celebrate the upcoming victory in Europe Day. This Wednesday will be the 79th VE Day, commemorating the day Nazi German soldiers laid down their weapons on the European front, essentially ending World War II on that side of the world. Mr. Aris Mendy, we want to thank you and all the other veterans out there for your service and continued dedication to our country. Yes, thank you all. All right, switching gears now and heading outside with live cam tonight. 
It's humid out there. Big surprise, right? Plenty of cloud cover in place. Temperatures have been very slow to fall through the 70s over the past several hours. It was an interesting day across South Central Texas, and honestly, a lot of that even started last night. Take a look at the radar loop over the past 12 hours. 1015 this morning, we had a few showers, a couple of isolated thunderstorms push across San Antonio, but a draped outflow boundary from storms that did push through parts of the hill country and really areas north of San Antonio allowed for scattered rain and strong thunderstorms to develop south and west of town earlier this afternoon, especially for places like Pearsall and Carrizo Springs. Even Catula actually found a little bit of hail with plenty of heavy rainfall. We had a couple of severe thunderstorm warnings that were issued well off to our south and west. Now, we have since quieted things down drastically across our neck of the woods. And as we zoom this out and take a look at the big picture across the Lone Star State, things are also looking pretty quiet. Just a low pressure system moving across the Mississippi River Valley, still sparking some rain and storms off to our northeast tonight. Rain chances drastically come down as we look ahead to the upcoming work week. Just an isolated chance here and there may be slightly better by this time next weekend, but still we are expecting damp mornings because the humidity is not going anywhere over the next several days. So stepping out starting tomorrow morning for the morning drive. Yes, you'll likely want to take the umbrella with you for some more patches of drizzle as well as some morning fog is expected. And you can see that here on our future cast by six, seven o'clock tomorrow morning as you are hitting the area roadways. Some of that fog notice could be dense in spots, so it wouldn't hurt to give your a little bit of extra time out the door and with that drizzle may need to use the windshield wipers here and there. Soggy spots on area roadway certainly possible before we start to see that to break up and lift on out of here by mid to late morning. Temperature wise, it is also going to be a very humid start tomorrow. Low 70s expected here in Bear County, potentially some upper 60s as you get into the hill country, 68 in Kerrville, 68 in Bernie, 70 one for places like Canyon Lake and New Braunfels. 72 is where we will start the day here in town tomorrow. So a gray start to our Monday, but I do think into the afternoon we will manage a few peaks of sunshine, helping temperatures warm 79 degrees, the forecast temperature for lunchtime plans. And then into the afternoon, we've got a forecast high pointed right around 85 officially here in town. But for areas that do find a bit more sunshine to pop back out earlier in the day, especially along and south of the Highway 90 corridor, upper 80s, even a few low 90s, certainly possible. We are expecting 90s to quickly return by Tuesday and even more so into Wednesday. Right now, forecast high temperature of about 95. Now, for context, our average high for this time of year, 84. So we are about 11 degrees above that if that verifies. And here's the thing, with the humidity in place, feels like temperatures are likely going to to be even hotter than that, potentially closing in on the triple digit mark. High pressure is really going to be in control over the next several days, but an area of low pressure moving across the Great Lakes region by Thursday and into Friday could allow for a weak front to slip through ahead of next weekend. If that's the case, a slight break in some of the humidity levels and temperatures could be found. And yes, maybe a few isolated storm chances. So we're going to detail that set up a little bit more in depth coming up in the next half hour, Courtney. Oh, the 90s. I can't with that. I'm not excited about All it. All right. I know you have to say it. So. Sorry. Just the messenger. <laughs> I okay? won't get mad at you. Okay. Thanks, Mia. A preview of instant replay right after the break. Running back Ezekiel Elliott is the Dallas Cowboys' third all-time leading rusher, and he's looking to add to those totals now that he's back with the team. For a preview of what's on instant replay, here's Larry Ramirez. I'll tell you what, Dak and Zeke, very excited yes, that they're reunited <laughs> and playing for the same team again. The Cowboys let Zeke walk last season for cap reasons. And after one year with the Patriots, Zeke is once again a Dallas Cowboy coming up tonight on Instant Replay. What do you want to prove in this new era? Um, you know, I'm just the guy who finished business. Ezekiel Elliott is back with the Cowboys, and the number one goal remains the same. 
won the Super Bowl. Zeke and the boys are chasing that ring. Dak and Zeke were both drafted in 2016, and now Prescott will once again hand off the ball to his good buddy. I mean, I'm a very fortunate, lucky man. I got a beautiful wife, I got a beautiful son. I've had 12 great years in this league, and I'm very thankful to have walked away healthy and playing great. Um, I mean, I told D'Amico last year, I said, don't call unless you absolutely need it. Could J.J. Watt return to Houston? He says the possibility is there, but time is running out. Watt tells the media this weekend at his annual charity softball game what the exact circumstances are. So, again, Mario's warming up, lands the lead left hook, chopping right hand, drops Maidana in round three. Mario Barrios, who knocked down Fabian Madonna last night in Las Vegas, successfully defended his championship belt, and Barrios did it with a right eye that swelled shut. We'll show you how Mario won his latest fight. The Texas Longhorns softball team, they're all smiles. And if you could have Wimby as your tour guide in France, where would you go visit? That's our poll question tonight. All that and much more on Incident Replay. Is that a thing? Because I'd love to go to Nice. Is he just going to, like, come chill? Because the Spurs are going to play two regular season <laughs> games over there. I know. So, like, yeah. we get to just choose where we would go. Yeah, pretty much, I guess. Right, I've got my vote in. <laughs> Thank you, Larry. <laughs> Coming up next, hear from two military veterans who say they're victims of malpractice from military doctors. KSAT investigates military medical malpractice and how these victims are fighting for justice for others after the break. They protect our freedoms and fight for our rights. However, our servicemen and women are being denied a right that we as civilians all have, and that is the right to sue the federal government for military medical malpractice. In her final story for KSAT Investigates, Lee Waldman met with two veterans who they say suffered negligence at the hands of military doctors. She also shows us how they're fighting to make sure others have the justice they say they were denied. <laughs> Can I be saying, spell your first and last name for me? Lauren Palladini. My name is uh, Des Del Barba. Two service members, each sharing a heartbreaking similarity. Had this happened to you when you were a civilian, would you have been able to file a medical malpractice? I would, yes. In 2019, then college senior Des Del Barba decided to follow his dream of service. I applied for officer candidate school, I got accepted. And then I went to Fort Benning to do basic combat training. He was only there for 35 days, but that would mark the beginning of how Del Barba's life would forever be changed. I know in my company, there was a little bit over 50 that had strep A. His symptoms started with a sore throat. Doctors on base tested him for strep throat with a rapid and 24 hour test. So rapid one came back negative. And then following the next day, um, the 24-hour one came back positive. However, nobody notified me. Or his drill sergeants. Del Barba's symptoms got worse, and he went to the base hospital. He says doctors there never checked his strep results and sent him home with cough medicine. That was Saturday. Early Monday morning, I um, basically started going into, like, shock. Left untreated with proper medications, Del Barba's strep throat infection worsened. It turned into a fleshing disease called necrotizing fasciitis. Then 21-year-old Del Barba slipped into a coma for two weeks before being taken here to Bamsi. He spent 100 days in the intensive care unit, underwent 42 surgeries, and had his leg amputated. Skin was taken from his back and chest, placed on his lower half. A simple penicillin shot would have avoided it all. Um, I, when I tell a story to like a civilian doctor or even my VA doctors, like they can't believe it. They can't believe that the system failed um, a service member this badly. I think sometimes when I like talk about it, it's almost like I, it's like an out of body experience. Lauren Palladini has had the same reactions from her civilian doctors after a botched cesarean section by a military doctor at what was then called Fort Bragg left her unable to have more children naturally. My husband, you know, he's an only child, so the only thing he's ever wanted is a family. Since when? I found out today. Congratulations! <laughs> yeah. After a normal pregnancy, then 22-year-old Palladini had to get a C-section because her birth wasn't progressing. The only thing that we had been told at the time was that I had lost more blood in my C-section than normal, but they weren't concerned. That was March 19th, 2019. Three days later, on March 22nd, Palladini was home with her daughter. 
when she started hemorrhaging. When the EMS arrived, I just remember like looking at them and um, they were like, um, she's critical condition. The new mother was taken to the civilian hospital because Womack Army Medical Center in North Carolina couldn't take her. This was the first of many hemorrhages throughout the course of a month while hospitalized. And um, I just looked at my husband and told him I loved him and to take care of our, our little girl because I wasn't sure that, you know, I was going to come out of it. Palladini had a hysterectomy to save her life. Due to trauma sustained during C-section. Now five years later, living in Bulverde, she's meticulously dug through her medical records and found something went wrong during her C-section. My artery had been not fully severed, but nicked in my C-section. An affidavit from a board-certified obstetrician and gynecologist echoes exactly that. Both Palladini and Del Barba were not able to sue for medical malpractice thanks to a 70-year-old statute. The Ferris Doctrine is a 73-year-old uh, uh, law that protects the uh, Department of Defense from service members suing them for medical malpractice. In 2019, the Sergeant First Class Richard Steiskull Military Medical Accountability Act was introduced and later included in the 2020 National Defense Authorization Act. It allowed us to file a claim against the DOD for medical malpractice or medical negligence. However, the Defense Department is the agency investigating the claims. I was denied initially in 2022. I was then again denied again in 2023. They're not alone. The data that we've seen, only 2% of cases uh, have been validated or affirmed uh, and those victims compensated. Congressman Joaquin Castro is co-sponsoring a resolution called the HEROES Act. The legislation calls for a third party to investigate claims of malpractice against the military, not the DOD. They should not have any less rights than civilians would have if they suffer it through medical malpractice. And yet right now, that's the case. It helps service members like me, service members um, all over the country that have been affected um, to basically have a chance to get justice. If I can prevent another woman from going through this with a DOD doctor, I'll keep fighting for that. For case that investigates, I'm Lee Waldman. And right now, there has not been much movement on the HEROES Act. It's sitting in the Judiciary Committee. Castro believes it will be rolled into a larger piece of legislation known as the National Defense Authorization Act, which will be voted on later in the year. All right, let's head back outside with live camp tonight again. Still humid, and that humidity is going to be a common trend over the next several days, which will make for some damp mornings with the patchy drizzle and the patchy fog. Now this morning, it was still a warmer than average start. 66 degrees was our official low temperature here in town, three degrees above the average of 63. But thanks to some of the cloud cover and the rain in the vicinity, it was a cooler than average into the day. 79 was our high temperature. That's below the average of 84. Our records, 99 and 45, set back in 1984 and 19. 1944, respectively. Not a ton of variation in those high temperatures across the region because of the cloud cover, but we are expecting a warming trend to take over 90s by Tuesday and Wednesday, and then potential front ahead of next weekend. We'll have more of those details after the break. Keeping children in their community after they're removed from their homes. That's the point of kinship placements for foster kids, letting kids stay with family or trusted adults. I sat down with a kinship family who told me about the difference they believe they're making. This is part of our KSAC community spotlight this month on foster care. But it's adorable to, to watch him with his little pole. And for the past two months, Sherry and Eric Thomas have been caring for a family member's child who was removed from his home. We got a phone call on a Thursday afternoon and Thursday night we were picking him up. They've become what's called a kinship family when a child who has experienced abuse or neglect is placed with people close to them. It can be someone that you have a significant, you know, uh, bond to, relationship with, family friend. It doesn't have to be blood relative. 
Sherelle Herbert is the specialty director for foster care organization SJRC Texas, where she oversees kinship placements and supports families. Talk with them and say, hey, what can we do to, to make this work? Making kinship work can change a child's life. We want these children, while their parents are working on things, to remain in their community, remain connected to those in their community, their school, their teachers, their relatives. Each day it seems like it's getting better and better. I think his guard is coming down. I went and bought him a little fishing pole. The bike has been. Day. That's his thing. And, and so we go out on the back porch and he'll ride his bike. The goal is always reunification with the parents, but in case that can't happen, they want to be set up for adoption. That's why kinship families are asked to get licensed, which can pull in extra benefits. 49% of foster care placements are kinship placements, and SJRC wants that number to be higher. Part of that is education about help that's available, which can include financial support or free coaching and therapies. This family is urging others to do it. It's going to all be worth it in the end to know we gave him that chance and that opportunity. Now, if you want to learn more about becoming a kinship family, you can head to the SJRC website. You can also help by participating in our KSAT Community Phone Bank, which is coming up on Tuesday, May 14th. You'll be able to call in between noon and 7 p.m. to learn more about foster care, ask any questions you have, and even pledge financial support during the live broadcast. We'll be right back. So we were really surprised to find that our rain gauge had half an inch Yay! in it. We didn't expect that, and not everyone got that, so we were we considered ourselves lucky. Yeah, most definitely. Yes. Some of us do wish that we had a little bit more rain by the time all was said and done this weekend, but we did have some more impressive totals across our southwestern counties and even across portions of the hill country since we had some storms move through, mainly north of San Antonio overnight last night. So here's a look at what was found in in area rain gauges across South Texas this weekend. Unfortunately, just about five hundredths of an inch officially in town at the airport. Kerrville, though, again, the hill country definitely needing some rain, almost an inch recorded there. Carrizo Springs off to our southwest, 0 0.85, 0 0.62 in Pearsall. Howitzville out east saw almost an inch of rain. But you can see closer to Bear County, those rainfall totals just were not as impressive. 0 0.07 in Helotus, 0.15 in Adkins. Again, a little bit better over six tenths of an inch. We've been talking about the drought monitor and how far east Texas, the areas that really have seen too much rainfall in too little time over the past week or so, not actually in a drought. We could use more rain here in our neck of the woods, especially across the hill country. So Kerrville, Bernie, Sisterdale, Bandera, even northern Medina County in extreme drought here in San Antonio. Most of us in moderate drought and then severe drought out west down Highway 90 and closer to the Rio Grande for places like Del Rio as well as Eagle Pass. Unfortunately, rain chances come down into the upcoming work week. Still a few isolated chances here and there, but definitely some patchy fog and drizzle in the morning. So the humidity is going to stick with us over the next several days. So expect damp starts to the next several days. Warming up though into the afternoons with more sunshine returning. 90s in the forecast as early as Tuesday that could carry over into Wednesday and Thursday before we find a cool front that right now looks to move in late Thursday and early Friday and that could cool us down slightly into next weekend and also give us a little bit of a break in some of the humidity. Now let's talk about that setup right now as we zoom this out and take a look at the lower 48. There's that area of low pressure that we were talking about earlier still sparking some rain and storms across the Mississippi River Valley. There's an area of low pressure also out west near the Rockies approaching the Four Corners region. That one has a front attached to it. Take a look at temperatures right now. It is 39 degrees in Salt Lake City, 51 in Boise, 52 in Portland, Oregon. Nowhere near that expected here in South Central Texas, but that low pressure system responsible for bringing that front through is going to be tracking eastward in the days ahead. Tomorrow it approaches the central plains, a four out of five risk for severe weather, all modes possible across portions of Oklahoma, stretching up into southern Kansas, an area that got battered by severe thunderstorms last week. No severe storms expected here in South Central Texas, but 
but that low pressure system is going to gradually work its way into the eastern half of the country by Thursday, dropping that front into the state of Texas. And then that is what will push through and bring us a break in some of that humidity and temperatures, maybe a few isolated rain chances into next weekend. So that's going to be something to check back in with us here in the days ahead. Until then, 75 degrees right now here in San Antonio, a dew point of 71, so it is sticky out there. 73 in Bolverde right now, 75 in Pleasanton at 76 out east in Gonzales. Tomorrow, patchy morning fog and drizzle expected in the morning. High temperatures in the mid 80s. We are warming things up into the 90s Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday, and then hopefully a little bit cooler as we head into next weekend. That last promise makes me feel like I can get through the week. We yeah. can do it. There's a light at the end of the tunnel. We've got this, we guys. Can do it. All right, thank you. All right, two new movies and a 25 year old Star Wars film caused a great disturbance in the box office force this weekend. Which movie took first place? The top five countdown next on the Night Beat. Their home and business sits on a tract of land approved by the city. Now one letter is leading to numerous citations. How did the city become aware of potential problems on a property with council approved zoning? Turns out that is quite a tale. KSAT investigates the criminal past of the disgraced former city official behind the letter and the developer who hired him. It's apparent to all of us what's going on. KSAT's investigation, including the developer's denial of involvement, is streaming now. Godzilla Kong, the new empire, slid back to number five this weekend on ticket sales of $4.5 million. Final cards in a circle. The horror yarn Taro scared up $6.5 million for a fourth place debut, while last week's number one movie Challengers faulted into third with $7.6 million. To quote Jedi Master Qui-Gon Jinn, there's always a bigger fish. The 25th anniversary re-release of Star Wars Episode I, The Phantom Menace, raced into second place with $8.1 million. Just wondering, you know, after this movie, if I don't go to prison, and you know, you're not busy, maybe we could go to a beach somewhere. Nothing could stop the fall guy from leaping to number one. The action flick led by Ryan Gosling and Emily Blunt landed at the top of the box office with a 28.5 million dollar debut. In Hollywood, I'm Rick Damagella. Both the Houston Texans and Dallas Cowboys are getting ready to hold rookie mini camps in the San Antonio Brahmas played the DC Defenders this afternoon. For a preview of what's on instant replay, let's head to Larry. All right, so the playoff push is underway right. in the United Football League. Brahmas running back John Lovett had a career day on the ground, but the Brahmas passing attack, well, it was off coming up tonight on instant replay. They take the handoff. Dormady. Back to the end zone. Matt, touchdown. That's Bernie Greyhound Quentin Dormady throwing a touchdown pass for the San Antonio Brahmas at the D.C. Defenders this afternoon. The Brahmas were facing a desperate squad trying to stay in the playoff hunt. We've got your highlights and postgame reaction. Every time he scores, he gives us the acrobatics, and we love it. The crowd goes wild, but really, it's this beautiful ball in. It has a curve. He beats Cyril just to it. San Antonio FC hosted Star Wars night at Toyota Field, and that's always a lot of fun. SAFC didn't get the three points they wanted. Instead, they walked away with one point after drawing Oakland Roots 2-2. And thanks to an injury, SAFC played the match with a new captain in Kevin Lambert. Mary Rominger has those highlights. Dak and Zeke are back together with the Cowboys. You'll hear from them. We've got the NBA playoffs, the Gunslingers, Mario Barrios, plus the Rangers and Astros. All that and more in just a few minutes on Instant Replay. They're like a little dream team. Excited to be back they together. are totally right. It's adorable. <laughs> yes. All right. Thank you, Larry. And we'll be right back.